card and fill one of those out, and we've got a gift for you in the back. We also have a welcome lunch today, so if you want to hang out, we've got some extra food right after second service. We'd love to get you, get to know you more and have you get to know us, but we're a pretty simple group. We're sinners saved by grace who really believe those words. It's not about rhetoric for us. There is nothing that we have apart from Jesus. We deserve nothing, but Jesus paid it all and gave us everything. And so we gather every Sunday morning. In fact, Matt and I have talked, because Matt's our church planner now in Sacramento, but he's going to call a Sunday morning gatherings a rally, because that's the intent. The intent is that we come together and that we rally around the gospel, the fact that Jesus paid it all, that we deserve nothing, but in him we have everything. He didn't hold anything back from us. And that's who we are as a church, the living proof of loving God that receives this good news, and God gives us all sorts of good gifts, that he paid it all is the best gift. After that, one of the next ones might actually be kids. We've got a couple pictures of kids here, two roses in the front that represent two beautiful, beautiful babies. Uh, here we go, River and Kaylee Henning, River O'Mara, and then we've got a couple pictures here. This will be the highlight of the sermon, so get your eyes in now. But uh, very, very special. And, and it really fits within the promise. That God has given us a promise, and it's not a promise of kids. It's far better than kids. But I do remember, we've got three kids as a family, and I still remember when my wife was 10 months pregnant. And, uh, and that's a real thing. Uh, she proved it, 10 months pregnant. And we had just gotten a new job. I had transferred over uh, to a church down in Orange County from L.A. County. And I remember being invited over for dessert to my, my boss's house. And it was all the staff and the elders, and it was essentially a welcome home, welcome to church for Drew and Jen, and Braden was on the way. This was about 10 years ago. And I remember sitting in, in Todd's house, and you've met Todd. He's the guy that looks like Shrek. He's preached here a couple of times, um, and just a good friend. I remember sitting, and I was a little nervous. Maybe it's your first Sunday here, and you know that nerves where it's like you don't know anybody yet, and I'm still new to the church, so I want to put my best foot forward. So my wife sits down, and she was a beautiful 10-month pregnant lady, and then there was me. And... And I think that this was, again, these are the good old days. So this is before three kids. I gained about 25 pounds with each pregnancy. Um, so I was, a, I was in really good shape. I thought I was coordinated. And I'm sitting there, and we're having dessert. Now, I need to paint the picture for you a little better. All white carpet. And they decided to have, like, strawberry cheesecake with all the red dressing. And we're drinking our coffee, and we're, hanging, we're having a great time. And you can almost have that sense of, like, I just don't want to screw it up. You know what I mean? It's your first day. And there was something that, that Jen had built in. And I don't know if you've been pregnant recently or you've seen some pregnant, but you know they have that like built-in shelf right here? So you get your cheesecake, and I still have one. So I can just rest it right here. And so she's got her cheesecake. I'm sitting next to her. I got my coffee, and we're having a great evening. And I've got that like, hey, just don't screw it up kind of moment. And I think I was trying to pretend like I was a good husband. So I think I got up to get her coffee or something. And as I got up, her baby bump was kind of in the way, and I remember bumping her, and it was like the coffee went everywhere. And it like went all over the right carpet, and it was just this huge stain, and the red cheesecake fell all over the white carpet, and all of a sudden, I had an issue. And it kind of felt like Adam, because we're gonna go look at Adam this morning, and what does Adam do when he sins, right? And it'd be really easy to say, well, the woman made me do it, right? And I remember looking down at the stain. I mean, you, you see that? Like, because there's part of me that sometimes we think about our sin. It's like, well, our sin's not that bad. It's like chocolate coffee on a chocolate, you know, chair. And you're like, it's not that bad. No one can really see it. And my hope is, as we've been reviewing the Promise series, and maybe you haven't been with us for the last two weeks, we're going to get you caught up real, real quick. In the beginning, God created everything. Right, church? Genesis 1-1. And how good was it? It was good. It's very, very good. It was so good that it was for relationship with God and his creation, and they enjoyed life and they enjoyed each other, but something happened after creation. The serpent comes and there's the fall, and that was last week. That was chapter 2 and chapter 3. And we ended with something that was so good, that was so wonderful, the perfect evening, the perfect time, and then we spilled something. And we all have stains in our life. You guys know that it's the wall maybe for you or there's the piece of carpet at home and some people don't notice it. They don't recognize it, but who does? You do. You know what you did. You see it. And my hope was last week we left, we, we passed an offering plate, which is fun for us because we don't ever do that, but we give stuff away in our offering plates. So you took a leaf. Do you remember your leaf? And the Pope was that you would attach it somewhere. You put it on your dashboard, you attach it to your purse. I saw a gal in Starbucks with this little fig leaf, and I go, oh, I don't know her, but she must go to our church. Or she's got new style, I don't know. But the hope was this week that we spent time staring at the stain of sin in our life. 
that we spent time being still and saying, wow, I've missed it. I've settled for less. And we use that language at Vintage Grace that sin is essentially settling for less. Adam and Eve settled for less than God's best. But I, my fear is when I say settled for less, my fear is that we just kind of leave it there. My fear is that we think of sin as just like the second best thing. Like how many of you guys are really bummed that the, the Giants aren't going to make the playoffs this year? Anybody bummed about that? Because I'm kind of bummed, but let's be honest, I'm not that bummed. Why? Because it's an odd year. Because they only play baseball on even years. And every other year they win the championship. So I'm really not worried about the Giants losing. And my fear is that many of us, that's kind of how we approach sin. It's really not that big of a deal the Giants to make the playoffs. It's really not that big of a deal that, that we've got a stain on our life and that there's sin in our life because the reality is well, next year it'll be better. My concern, and I don't want us to miss this as a church, when we talk about sin as settling for less, my concern is then we leave with the sense of it's okay because the even year's coming. So it's not that big of a deal. I mean, look at what happens. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife, they hid themselves from the presence of God. Now, when God created everything and formed the land so they could have a relationship with him, what made the land so special? It was more than the ribeye. It was more than the plants. It was more than the beauty. What made the land special? His presence. The fact that God created them, that they were the climax of all creation, and that God made you and me to have a relationship with him, that's what made the land special. It wasn't the land that was special. It was the land that was there so the presence of God would be with them. Do you see that, church? So when they sin, don't hear us say, because that's not who we are as a church. As a church, we talk about sin. Some of you think we talk about it too much. I'm here to say we probably don't talk about it enough. But I take a little bit of pride when someone grabbed me after church last week and said, man, I am just so glad that we talk about sin here. Because it's all over scripture. We have to take time to stare at the stain of sin in our life. And my prayer is that we did that last week. Did you do that? Here's my conviction. You probably didn't do it enough. I need more time to think about the depth of my depravity. So we talked through Ephesians about the bottom of the ocean floor, that wherever we think as sinful as we are, we're still not as low as it can go. And over and over again, we're gonna see this inscription. I've seen this in my life, but we need to take time to stare at the stain and to say, what am I gonna do with this? What am I gonna do? Because Adam and Eve have a solution. You know what it is? We're gonna hide. Now, how well is that gonna work for them? Can we hide from God? Some of you this morning, this is your, your first time coming back to God. You haven't been to church in a long time. Let me hear you. God's come for you, not the other way around. You're hiding from God, but God says, no, no, no. I know exactly where you are. And we're going to look at the text this morning because here's kind of the summary statement for the morning. Last week we saw Adam and Eve settled for less in the garden. And we left them covered, hiding, having the presence of God broken. And this week, we're going to see that the stain of sin actually affects us all with awful consequences. And two of my favorite words in Scripture comes from Ephesians. What is it, church? But God transforms our obstacle, our sin, into an opportunity to bring him even more glory and tell the ultimate story that the world has ever heard. If you have your Bibles, Paul, read me in Genesis chapter 3. If you need one, raise your hand. We've got ushers walking around with them. I always say that as if that's true, and then someone jumps up and grabs it. Thank you, Eric. If you need a Bible, just raise your hand. I am on page 2. That's how fast we're going. We're going to cover the whole Old Testament in 15 weeks. We're at Genesis 3, so our pacing needs to pick up a little bit. But following with me, we're going to cover a lot of verses. We're going to start in verse 8. Here it is. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of day, and the man and his wife, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. They hid themselves from God among the trees in the garden, but the Lord God called them, and he said, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you walking in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you not eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, well, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is it that you have done? And the woman said, well, the serpent deceived me, so I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and above all the beasts of the field, and on your belly you shall go, and to the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, 
And you have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat of the plants of the field. And by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Father God, as we read these words, I pray that we don't just hear them intellectually, but that you make them not just information, but transformation for our heart. Lots of words on this page, but Father God, help us to understand why you inspired Moses to pen it, to write this, not just for the Israelites in their town, but in our town, so that we might not only understand it, but that we might live it. That we might understand that we are loved, not just because we're lovable, but even more so in spite of the fact that we're unlovable, that we're offensive. That we've defamed you, that we've disregarded you, that we've dishonored you that we've not shown you the love and the affection that only you deserve and that we've often settled for less. But Father God, help us to understand what that sin has done to us and reveal to us who you are in spite of that. Give us hope today, we pray. And all those people said, amen. Are we ready, church? One of us is, and he was here first service. So second service, are we ready? Okay, we got lots of time until the Niners are on. Um, So that means I've got a couple of hours. All right, so Genesis chapter three, we're gonna walk through and try to understand what do we do with this sin? What do Adam and Eve do? What do we do? And I want you to think about it. I want you to notice the amount of questions. You see the question marks in the text this morning? You see how many times God seeks us out? I, I want to note, the stain of sin affects us all. Sin is a part of our life. Have you noticed that recently? If not, you can babysit my kids whenever you'd like. You can see the stain of sin affecting us all. And the stain of sin affects us vertically before God. Presence is broken. This isn't just like, well, I'm just settling for last, no big deal, next time we'll get them, guys. No, this is eternal, forever separation. This is sin in our life, and we must deal with sin. And if you don't like sin, don't go to Vintage Grace. Because we're sinners that have liked sin, that are committed to saying that's a lesser joy than who Jesus is. We want to be done with that former way of life, and we want to move on to something better and something greater. But the stain of sin is still with us. It affects us. We need to stare at it. We need to spend time thinking about it. It affects us horizontally. Nope. Yes, horizontally. I get my things mixed up here. Marriage. Children. Coworkers. You see sin affect you in those areas? It affects us all over. It ruins us vertically. It ruins us horizontally. And we're going to see that in the text this morning. We're going to start with Adam. Now, we're going to start with Adam because God started with Adam. Now, do you see, do you think that's unique? Because who sinned first? Oh, come on, church. Not rocket science. Who ate the fruit first? Eve. Eve ate the fruit. So why doesn't God deal with Eve? Uh Uh-oh. You're like, that's why I'm here. I think God goes to Adam because he says, Adam, I created you first. I created you for a sacred, special relationship that was in the garden. I created you for something. I gave you a helper that was suitable and that was fit, but I created you first, so we're going to you first. And he goes to Adam, and here's what he says. Remember the verse 9. That's where we ended last week. But the Lord God called a man and said, where are you? Now, does, does God not know where Adam is? Because there are moments that I think in our life that we think we're that good at hiding our sin that nobody knows. Because Drew, our pastor, doesn't know. Our life group leader doesn't know. Our wife doesn't know. Our husband doesn't know. Who knows? And there's moments in our life that the big purple stain in the white middle of the floor, that we need to understand and recognize how awful this is. That we don't take sin lightly. It's not, oh, no big deal. That you can see it even when it blends in, and you can rub it around and say, you know, I didn't like that color anyways. So you can make the sin cover it all, so then you're just all, all, all sinful. But we need to spend time thinking about the stain of sin in our life. And if you didn't get a chance to this week, I encourage you, go get more leaves. They're in the back. Take a couple. Put them everywhere. It happened for me this week to spend time staring at the stain in my life, to, to think about what am I doing when I sin, when Satan comes in and when he whispers. And he says, well, what about this? What about this? So God comes and he says, where are you? And Adam said, I heard the sound of you, your presence in the garden, and I was afraid. Guys, this is the very thing that made the garden sacred and special now is causing him fear. This is drastic for Moses and for the Israelites. The thing that God wired us for is now causing us fear because I was naked, I hid myself. He was naked before this moment, guys. He was always naked. He was created naked. 
But at this moment now, there's shame, there's fear, and maybe we're experiencing some of that as a church for the first time. We're starting to wrestle with, wow, I actually am sinful. It's not just about going to church or being in a life group or giving to my church. It's about relationship with God and understanding the chasm that exists between his holiness and mine. It's not even close. So Adam gets this question. Now, do you you see the questions so far from God? Because here's what God's going to do with Adam and with Eve. He's going to do three things. He's going to seek them. Again, it's that whole idea of, well, I'm coming back to find God. No, no, no. God's been pursuing you the whole time. He's going to sift them. He's going to ask them questions. And then he's going to give them a sentence once he hears their response. Right now he's seeking them. Where are you? I haven't lost you. I just want you to step forward. They step forward, and then this is what he says here. He said to him, I heard the sound of you, so I I was naked. And God says, well, who told you that you were naked? See the question? And then he says this, have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Now, does God know the answer to these questions? Why is he asking a question then? Again, you're like, that's why I came here. He's asking the question simply for this. You know those moments where sin starts to creep in your life, and don't you wish you could just get a pause? You could push pause on your life. You could step back and say, ooh, that's not going to play so well. You fast forward on your personal DVR. Have you done that in your life before? And you start to see how the sin starts to play out. Some of you here this morning, because you've looked at your life and you said, wow, I've gone forward and backwards, and I'm not pursuing God. That's why I'm here. God's pursuing, and God's pursuing through questions. And what I love about this is God's asking questions because he wants to redeem the fallen being. He already knows the answer. He already knows that he deserves sentencing, but he doesn't start with sentencing. He gives them a chance to repent. Now, I don't know what God would have done if they would have repented. Moses has no desire to tell us. We have no idea. But here's the point. What does this text tell us about God? That God is patient with us. God already knows the answer, but he comes to Ab and he says this, Who told you that? Who told you that you were naked? Have you not eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Now, I love this moment in Adam's life. It's a moment of truth. He gets a chance to say, to be a big boy and say, I was wrong, I blew it. Do we need to practice those words, church? If we don't don't have those words down, we need to be staring at our sin a little more. We need to recognize it. We need to feel it. We need to embrace it in the sense of we are broken people. So what does Adam do? I mean, we all know the story. We've all heard it. Here's what Adam does. He's a coward. He's a spineless coward, and here's what Adam does. God asks this question, and here's what the man says. The woman made me do it. Are you kidding me? The woman made me do it. Now, I want you to pay close attention. He doesn't just blame Eve. Who does he really blame? The woman who you gave me. How many of you guys are blame shifters in your sin? Well, God, it's someone else's fault. God, if you just would have given me a better job, then I wouldn't have taken that job and I wouldn't have seen the secretary. God, if you just would have done this and given me a better X, then I would have had more Y. And we blame God for our choices and for our circumstances. Go back to the beginning. What was the intent of everything in God's creation? First and foremost, his glory. After his glory, who did he find the most glory in? Adam and Eve. You and me. And everything he gave to us was for our good and was for his glory. Because God is most glorified when we're most satisfied in him. That was the garden. And in the garden, Adam had it all, and all wasn't good enough, which is why we should take very seriously the things that we pursue with our time and our treasure and our talent. Because Adam had it all, and it wasn't good enough. So Adam, instead of saying to God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, instead of saying, hey, I blew it. He says, well, the woman made me do it, and it's really your fault, God. It's really your fault for why I blew it. Now, here's what I love. At this point, if I'm God, what do I do? I mean, it's a pretty simple solution. But God's been asking questions this whole time, I think because he wants to redeem his fallen image. He's not fallen. The image of him has fallen, and he pursues us, and he asks questions. So here's the sentence that God gives to Adam, and I want you to notice the sentence to Adam and to Eve, and I want you to see the mercy in it. Grace is unmerited favor. Mercy is not getting what you really deserve. What do Adam and Eve really deserve? Lest you touch it, you will surely die. Done. Over. Here's what God does to Adam, and he says to Adam, because you've listened to the voice of your wife. Now, was Eve tempting Adam in the garden? Not trying to trick you. 
God says don't do it. Eve says here it is. Is that a temptation to sin? Okay, we're on the same page. Again, we're going to go hard and fast, so keep up. Eve tempts. Is being tempted a sin? No, I don't think so. Jesus dealt with lots of temptation. Notice what the author says here. Because you listened to the voice of your wife and you ate of the tree. Because you did what God so clearly said to not do, you ate of the tree, and because of that, cursed is the ground. Now notice this, he doesn't curse Adam as a person. He curses the ground. He says, cursed is the ground because of you, and in pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles. Remember chapter 2, thorns and thistles aren't in the equation yet. Now thorns and thistles are introduced, and it shall bring forth from you, and you shall eat in the plans of the field, and the sweat of your face you shall eat the bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, and you are dust, and so the dust you shall return. What did God create Adam for? Climax of his creation, for his glory, but what else is the role that God gave Adam? Remember? To rule. To work. Literally, to work the land. In fact, the word to work is also the same word in the Hebrew for to worship. So that as we are working the land, we are actually worshiping God. That's what we're doing when we work. And what is cursed now is the process of working. What's going to happen when we work? In the garden, I think, as Adam worked, what did he do? Right? There's a sense of everything that Adam did was fun, was enjoyable. Work wasn't burdensome. It was worship. That's what work was. That's what Adam did. Now what does Adam do? He sweats. How many of you guys like sweating? Is that an enjoyable process? Beads of fluid profusely coming off of your brow that cause you to stink. I'm I'm trying to figure out what's that age with my boys. When do we start deodorant and when do we not? This is what Adam says. Now, apparently. Have you babysat recently or no? Here's the sentence that God gives Adam. The thing that I actually created you for. The thing that I made to get me the most glory in my town, it's all about my glory. I made you so that you would worship me. But in your town now, that very thing, that very process has been compromised. Work will not be like it was originally. That's the curse. We're going to keep going. He goes to Eve. He sifts Eve in the same way he sifts Adam. He asks questions. He's giving her a chance to calibrate, to think, to catch her breath. You know, you're in that fight with your spouse or your kids. It would be much smarter if you would, cleansing breath, and then unleash the wrath of God. But he gives Eve that chance, and here's what he says. He says, after where are you? He's already found her. He's already sought her. Then he says, I heard the sound of you naked. Adam throws woman under the bus, thud, thud. And the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, he asked the question. The Lord God says to the woman, what is this that you have done? You see the question? He's giving her a chance. Eve, how clear was I when I said do not eat? Now, commentators wrestle with was Eve there, because the command first went to Adam. It's pretty clear that Eve knew the command. Why? Because she even adds to it, lest I touch it or I'll surely die. She understands that this is rubbish. She understands this is a lie. She understands that this would lead to a stain in her life, but she buys the lie and she eats. So so God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit say, so what is it that you have done? And here's what Eve says. The woman said, the serpent deceived me. See the blame game? Have you guys ever tried these words before? I'm sorry. I blew it. I just want to know, can we do it? Just say, I blew it. One, two, three. I'm just wondering if it's in our DNA. Adam misses, Eve gets a chance, Eve says, no, no, it's, it's the devil that made me do it. That's why I ate. So Jesus, like a good God, and the Father, like a good dad, and the Spirit, like the best discerner, listens to the appeals from his people that are on trial. And then he gives the sentence. And guys, here's the, here's the thing we must leave with. The devil made me do it, she made me do it. Those aren't acceptable answers. We have to own our choices. We have to own them, the things that bring us joy and the things that we settled for. We did them, they are ours. And here's what God says to Eve. He says to the woman, and notice the parallels to Adam. He says to the woman, I will surely multiply your pain. Who's the I here? God. Don't tell me God doesn't use pain. I want you to see the grace and the mercy and even the punishment. I, God, will multiply your pain in childbearing. How fun is it to give birth? I mean, we've got drugs to cover it up. We've got all sorts of things, right? Because what happens when you give birth, ladies? It hurts. I am so glad I'm a man. So thankful. 
I mean, I, I don't know what I would do with Eve. It'd be like a cuss word if I was a woman. Here's what God says. What has God created Eve to do? To give him glory. And how will Eve do that? By having your kids. By having a marriage and a partnership and a, and a spouse. And you see the, the, the punishment here is that all the things that I've called you to do. Now, don't hear me say this is the climax of calling for women is having kids and getting married. That's not Moses' point here at all. If you don't have kids and you're not married, you're not missing necessarily anything. What's the climax of creation to do? To give God what? You don't need kids for that. You don't need a spouse for that. This is the climax of creation. But for Eve, she's been created, and part of her calling in their town is to multiply. So when God gives her that calling, now he's cursed the very calling he's created them for. Do you see the irony? Now, there's mercy in this. You know why? Because eventually they're going to be cast out of the garden. Every time that they have kids, every time, what are they going to think about? What do you think about when you're screaming, one, two, three, push! What do you think about? I don't go to the garden, but that's the intent of God. This is a part of the fallen world. God comes to Eve and he says, as a result of your sin, the things in which you were designed to do, you're going to have pain doing it. You're going to sweat when you work at him. You're going to be in pain. Marriage is going to be harder. It's going to be more difficult because you're fallen beings, because you're not living perfectly. And this is a, a sentence from God Almighty to them for their sin. The devil made me do it doesn't matter. They did it, and this is the gift that God gives them. This is the consequence, but the consequence is a gift. He's not only asking questions, which is a gift, but he's given them an opportunity from this moment forever on to think about, to tell their kids, to tell their family, when we work and work is hard, that's a sign and a symbol of our need for grace. This is where it comes from. It comes all the way back to the garden. So if you're pregnant, bless you. What an opportunity that you get to be reminded of the grace that God has for you. And we'll pray for your husband. Because here's the big idea, guys. Big idea of all of the text. The stain of sin affects us all. God's glory has been affected vertically because his presence is now broken with us. And I want you to note the promise isn't broken. The effects of sin is that the presence is broken, but the promise of the presence is not broken. In fact, that's what we must see in Genesis chapter 3, is that the promise in the word of God and the glory of God is not available to be compromised. I'm going to say that again. God's glory will not be compromised even though Adam and Eve stink. God's glory won't be. And that's what we must see. But what's going to happen now is as they live their life, to give God glory, to be in his creation, to subdue it, to lead it, to love to be the living proof of loving God, it's going to be difficult. It's not going to be easy, and it's a result of sin. It's not just settling for less. It's oh so much more. It's not being sanctified. It's seeing God in his holiness and me in my lack thereof and seeing that the chasm is big and it is wide, and it's staring at the stain and saying, I've got a problem that I can't deal with. I take great pride as a preacher in us dealing with sin. I think in a healthy sense. I don't think it was until I was in college when I actually, for the first time, wept over my sin. Have you cried over your sin lately? Have you spent time still before a holy, righteous God and said, why am I alive? If not, grab more leaves. Put them in more places. Spend more time recognizing the fact that you have settled for less and that we are far from what God has created and intended us to be. But understand that the promise of God is not broken. That his promise is in spite of who I am. That his promise is superior to that, which is why some of us are even here this morning. It's because God has a promise for you and for me. That he's not going to leave us. That our sin won't stop him from his glory. So the text continues on. Now I want us to pay attention here because it's going to get a little confusing. So are you with me right now, church? You might not be in three minutes, but we're going to try. Here we go. So the man called his wife's name Eve. Now at this point, she was just woman, out of man. Remember that part, chapter 2? Right now he calls him Eve. Now I think this is a step of faith for Adam, because here's what Eve means. Eve means breath of life. It means she was the mother of all the living. Now what do Adam and Eve deserve at this moment? Death. But God doesn't give them that, because even in God's consequences, even in his sentencing, he has a hope for a future. So God doesn't strike them dead in the spot. In fact, Adam, I think, understands this. So he says, I'm going to call you Eve because more is going to come from this. 
because the story is not over. If you're at a point in your life right now where you think the story's over, read Eve's life. Her story should have been over, but God. So Adam calls his wife Eve. She was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made, even in the punishment, the Lord God has provision for Adam and for his wife. He made garments of skin and he clothed them. Now the garments of skin is from an animal. I think it's a foreshadowing of the fact that we need to be covered and it's only going to be by blood. It's not going to be by anything else. It's a foreshadowing that Moses gives us, that God gives us in the sentencing. Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. It's kind of like what Satan said was actually true. See what I'm saying? To half truths. Satan says, you're going to know the knowledge of good and evil. You're going to be like God. Now, there's a huge difference. And, and the best way I could describe it from a commentator was this way. It's kind of like a cancer doctor knows about cancer, but not in the same way that a cancer patient knows about cancer. A cancer patient knows cancer. A cancer patient knows the effects and the results and the vomit and the nausea and the chemo and the hair loss in a way far different than a doctor does. Does that make sense? This is what Moses is simply saying here. You actually do now know the knowledge of good and evil. And you know how wretched you are. And you know that God is holy and righteous and you can't be in his presence. So here's what God does. You know this, but God, like a good surgeon, makes cuts that are intended to heal doesn't mean they don't hurt, but they're intended to heal. So now, he says this, now lest he, Adam, reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Two trees in the garden, you remember? Knowledge of good and evil, do not touch or you surely die. What's the other tree? Tree of life. I think the intent here that Moses tells us is Adam and Eve were intended to live forever. Now, we, we got to focus here. This is where it gets tough. God in his punishment loves these people enough to say, I don't want you to live like this forever. Why? Why is their current state so damaged and not worthy of life forever? What's going on in their current state? What's been separated? The presence of God. It's what we call hell. God in his infinite mercy and grace says, I don't want you to stay in the garden because if you stay in the garden and if you eat of the tree of life, you will be alive forever in your current state, which is what? Hell. What made the presence of, what made the garden good was the presence of God. If that separated, the garden's no longer good. And that's been gone. So God in his grace and in his love and his infinite wisdom and mercy says, I don't want you stuck in this state. I still have a hope for you. And that's going to start with me getting rid of you. He goes this, So the Lord God therefore sent him out of the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. And he drove the man out to the east of the Garden of Eden, and he placed cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. Why is he guarding the tree of life? Because that's an awful state of existence apart from the presence of God. You see that, church? If Adam and Eve eat of the tree of life, separate from the presence of God, that is the state of hell for eternity. But God in his grace says, no, 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 my love for you is so good that I'm going to get rid of you so that you don't have to stay like this forever. Because God has a plan. Even when our circumstances, even when we sin and our circumstances look awful, God has a promise that never leaves us or forsakes us. God is in the middle of each step. Now, here's what I think. I think in America, in the church today, what we do more than anything is we understand. You guys all see the stain, right? I mean, I picked a dark chair on purpose because I think many of us just try to cover it up. So what we do is we say, well, it blends in, but after so long, it doesn't blend in. And we go down to Bed Bath & Beyond or Target and we buy these slip covers. Because how good does this chair look now? It's as good as new. It's clean. It's comfortable. It's a little wet. But nobody knows. We think that slip covers are good, and we do that with our sin. We call it church on Sunday mornings. We call it tithes and offerings. We call it doing things so that we feel good about us. Those are slip covers. The, the text continues on. I think what the text is going to show us is that slip covers don't suffice. Because after Adam and Eve leave, they go do what they were created to do, which means they make babies. And when they make babies, Adam has Cain, and Cain comes in the picture. Here's what happens with Cain. We don't have time to deal with it all. We're just covering a lot. Here's what Cain does. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel, and he killed him. He killed him. The Lord God said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? Again, you see the grace of God in asking questions? You see that grace? Does God know where the brother is? Absolutely. But he says, dude, where's your brother? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? He's almost as good as his parents. Might be worse. 
Cain then finally gets it. He finally has his Talbot library moment, which again was it for me. And I pray you've had those moments in your life where you understand the brokenness, where you find yourself in tears, when you're weeping over your sin. We need those moments, church. We must have them or we can't understand our need for a savior. Cain gets it and he says, get away from me. The punishment that I deserve, no slip cover can have. Then Cain goes away from the presence of the Lord. I think this is what starts to happen. I don't care what slip covers you have. I don't care what you put on. The stain just continues. And it might be a different color this time, and it might run deep, but the stain continues. And we can cover it. And even now at second service, good thing we don't have three services. I mean, this is like a mush pot. It just continues and continues and continues. And I want you to see what happens when we sin. Then Cain went away from the what, church? Guys, the presence of God is heaven. That's why we gather on Sunday mornings to remind ourselves that he's not left us, that he is for us, that he is with us. And Cain misses it and Adam and Eve miss it. And we need to understand this as parents, that we want this for our kids. Lest they start to think that the Hawaii vacations and the nice house and financial peace is what it's about. It's not. I want my kids to understand it is only about pursuing the presence of God because there your pleasures are eternal, because there your joy is full, because everything else is a cheap substitute, and it's not an every other year substitute. It's a forever tarnished, separated from the word and the love and the affections of God. Do we get that, church? Do we get how important sin is? How slipcovers don't suffice because you think Cain would get it, and then it gets worse. Then Lamech comes on the scene. And in Lamech, we see this constant spiral effect. Chapter 4, verse 23, he says this, I went and I killed the man. So he says to his wives, if Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. Now you do the math as we keep going generation upon generation. How far off are we? And it's easy for us in the church of America to say, well, I didn't kill anybody. I, I didn't do it. I'm not that bad. Have you ever said that? That's Satan. That's Satan getting us to, to, to start to believe that we're not that bad because we look at others for our value instead of looking at him. We look at him, the Imago Dei which he gave us is broken and shattered and we're a mess. And it gets so bad all the way to the people of Noah, which is where we'll be next week, that verse 6, 5 says this, then the Lord God saw the wickedness that man was great in the earth. And I want you to read this, church, because I, I don't want you to think that this is Drew's story. This is God's story. He saw the wickedness, and read the yellow with me, and that every... I mean, do you get that? That every intention of their heart was evil. How much is every? See, I think we live the lie that we're not that bad that our slip covers are pretty good. But we've got things figured out. And it doesn't take me very far into my day every day to be reminded and realize, man, I'm not even close. I'm not even close. And it leads to brokenness. And it leads to tears. And I want us to cry as a church over our sin. I think we need more sackcloth in America. I think we need more moments of repentance and confession but I want to be very careful because there was a moment in my life where I took, I think, the unhealthy amount of pride in people crying at church on Sunday mornings. It was like that was kind of the goal as a preacher. Because I wanted you to get that you were sinful, and you don't. I don't. We don't get how bad we are. The bottom of the ocean floor is not deep enough. But when we follow God, do we spend time weeping forever? Think about the man and Acts that gets healed in front of the temple gates. Is he crying? He's begging for alms, and then what happens when he gets healed? What's he do? He's leaving and praising God. I want us to take time as a church to mourn our sin, but I want us to understand that even though slip covers don't suffice, Romans 5 shows us that there's something coming for Adam and Eve that will. This is the kind of verse that used to get me excited because we didn't understand that our sin equaled death. We thought that our sin equaled, well, I'm going to pay a speeding ticket. 
So Paul writes this to the church of, of Rome. He says this, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, so too death through sin. And so death spread to all men, because all sin, for sin indeed was the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. But death reigned from Adam to Moses, and even over those who were sinning was not like the transgression of Adam or of Lamech or of anybody else, because we're not that bad. No, 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 you are. We are. Adam was a type of the one who was to come. We don't need slip covers, brothers and sisters. We need a Savior. And if we don't get that, then we're in trouble. If we think all we need is to go to church on a Sunday morning and get a slap on the rear sermon and say, Woohoo! Let's do this Jesus thing. Guys, we can't do this Jesus thing apart from Him. Apart from Him, we have nothing. But let's not sit in our sin and wallow in sorrow. Because the goal of dealing with our sin is not to be sad. The goal in dealing with our sin is to be saved. And when we're saved, we are happy people. And it's rooted in who God is, not in who we are. Let's go back to see what God does with a serpent. Chapter 3. Here's what God does. And the Lord God said to the serpent, he doesn't ask the serpent any questions. You see that? He's very direct with the serpent. No questions, no future hope of repentance and restoration. He says to the serpent, because you've done all this, cursed are you. Not cursed is the ground, cursed are you amongst all the livestock, amongst all the beasts of the air, and you shall go on your belly, and to dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And then he says this, the ultimate curse. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. Here's what he says. There will be a war from this point on between those who treasure Christ and between those who don't. There's nothing in between. You are an offspring of Eve and of Jesus, or you're an offspring of Satan himself. There is no in-between. There's none of this casual Christianity in God's economy or in God's world. He says this, Satan, there's going to be a war that's going to go on until I crush you between your offspring and mine. And that's going to continue on. Now, I want you to note the significance of the word her, almost exclusively throughout the Hebrew text and throughout the Scripture. Offspring is in reference to the man, why is the offspring not referenced to the man in this context? Because God doesn't use Joseph for Jesus. I think it's a huge indicator for us all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 that God would have a virgin birth that is miraculous. That it's about her offspring. And yet then he changes tenses in the form and he goes to him and he, Jesus, shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now understand this. There are moments in our life where it feels like Satan is making ground. Do you feel that? I felt it this week. I felt it all day today. I'm faking it as much as I can, but I'm as sick as I've been in months, years. I feel awful. And there's moments like this where you go, man, Satan's good. And there's other moments where I'm like, but he's not. He's not that creative because it's just health. And I'm going to take a nap today while the Niners are winning, and it's going to be good. But there's moments in our life where we feel like Satan's winning, where he's making progress, where he's, he might even be winning in your marriage and in your family and in your job. And we need to go back to the promise in the midst of the sentence from God. The promise to Satan is that you will not win. I don't know what area of your life right now that you feel like Satan's winning in, but you need to understand this promise of 315. You understand what God says to the serpent. You will not win. Win, and there will come a point where he will bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And the heel is not a bruise that's terminal or eternal. In fact, there's gonna be moments in Satan's life where Satan's like, We got Jesus dead. I think Jesus is laughing all the way. Wherever you are right now, where you feel like Satan's made ground and taken effort and taken territory, go back to this promise. Lay your heel be bruised. But what will happen to Satan? His head will be crushed. For a serpent, what does that mean for his life? It's done. It's over. The promise of God doesn't leave us in sorrow and in tears. The promise of God makes us happy. The promise of God is that we who are stained and unholy, that he loves us and that he cares for us. And the promise of God that we saw throughout Genesis, that Adam and Eve settled, presence is broken, but God is a transforming God. And but God transforms our obstacle, our sin, our separation into his opportunity. Look at those words. It's the wrong O word. We think of life as obstacles. We think of sin as obstacles. God says, no, no, no. I'm going to allow sin in your life so you actually understand how much you need me that apart from me, you can do nothing. 
So he's allowed sin into the world so that he might get even more glory. It's his opportunity to bring even more glory and tell the ultimate redemption story. Now, how many of you guys like stories where the, the favorite team always wins? Who are the evil empire in sports? Who are they? The Yankees, right? The Patriots. Why do these teams always win? They spend lots of money, and what else do they do? They lie and cheat and deceive, right? You with me? And that's what these teams do. Now, how much fun is it to root for the other team? I mean, even if you were a Yankee fan, we had a couple first service. They left right before communion. <laughs> if you're a Yankee fan, is it really that much fun to just always win? It gets boring at some point. If you knew that every time you came up to the plate and you took that fastball that it was going to be a home run, at what point do home runs get boring? <laughs> You're not helping me, B. Franchetto. I think they get boring. I think God could have wired us in such a way that we would just would have done whatever he told us to do. But he gave us free will. He gave us the opportunity to strike out, and we do apart from him. But God... I don't even think that it's just more fun for us as the participants. I think he gets more glory because what stories do we love? We love the Rudy stories. That's the stories we love. We love the fact that we are nothing. And I'm here to admit to you right now, the Giants were not the best team the last three out of five years. Not once. Not once did they deserve to win. It's part of why we loved them. They were the band of misfits. That's who they were. They were rubbish. And now they're just proving it to us this year. Guys, this is what God does with us. He takes our circumstance, he takes our sin, he takes our separation, and he says, I'm gonna redeem that and make it amazing. Whatever your circumstance are right now, I'm gonna invite the ushers forward because we're gonna go to communion. And we're gonna take them on, we're gonna sit with our elements because we need to think about the promise that God has given us in the midst of the curse. In the midst of the curse of being separated, of being fallen, of being sinful, we need to take more time to sit in our sin. But we don't leave sorrowful. We don't leave church in tears. How do we leave church? Happy! We're excited because our slipcovers failed because his promise doesn't. That's how we leave church every Sunday. That's why we come for a sacred gathering so we can be sent. And as the ushers come, I'm going to ask you, if you were a believer, would you close your eyes, bow your head, and open your hands? to receive this. I'm going to pray over these elements, and as you take, I'm going to ask you not to eat yet. We're going to eat it all together as a church. I'm going to ask you to take and to receive and just to hold on to it, and to think about your sin, and then also to think about the promise. And we're going to hear a song sung in a couple of seconds that's a message from God to you that I want you to hear. Father God, we come before you. And for those of us that love you, we want to take this gift that you've given us we want to take it because your promise never fails, because you are for us, because you pursue us, because you love us. And we want to receive that today. We want to receive that in faith and in grace and in mercy, that even in our sin you ask questions and you pursue us and you don't kill us instantly. So may we receive that gift today. May we receive the gift of your body, which was broken for us, and your blood, which was shed for us. If you don't treasure Christ, I just encourage you to pass this and pray and talk to God and ask him to show you hear God's heart for you we spend so much of our life hiding and God's like where are you you don't have to hide I know you don't deserve my love but I run after you I pursue you I've chosen you I care for you it's why he gathered his disciples before he was going to give his life willingly. And he said, we're going we're to partake of the Last Supper. and I'm going to break this bread and I'm going to give it to you because I want you to remember because there's going to be times that you're going to forget that you're worth it. We need to weep over our sin. We need to have more sackcloth. We need to take more time and be still and repent. But we also need to celebrate. We need to celebrate those words that we just heard sung. Did you hear those words? I've listened to this song over and over again all week because I knew it was coming, and it's in my promise book. It's in my journal. Because so far, my journal is Imago Day, Drew, you suck. And I shouldn't say that in a sermon. I'm sorry. Leaf, shattered image, but God. Come out of hiding. I loved you before you knew what was love. Come out of hiding. You're safe here with me. I cover you. It's more than I got your back. It's I gave you mine. 
illuminate everything. Don't be frightened by intimacy. Get rid of the shackles. The victory's mine. The veil has been torn. You're not far from home. And brothers, sisters, this is why I love Sunday mornings. We get to remind ourselves that home's coming. There's moments our heels are getting snipped at, but we need to be still and we need to take this and remember that he is victorious. Amen? Take this in remembrance of him. So this is my blood shed for you. Because slipcovers don't suffice. Take this in remembrance of him. Father God, we believe that you are for us. It's not because we're worthy. It's not because we deserve it. It's because you've decided to attach your glory to us. So we come before you as a holy, righteous God who don't deserve anything but praise from us and have gotten nothing of the sorts. We've settled for less and we repent and we say that we're sorry, but God, we don't leave and live in sorrow. We live and we respond in faith. We take actions. Adam and Eve's actions failed, but you covered them. You made a way. You provided something better. So Father God, today we receive that. And we want to live that, and we want to love that, and we want to be that. And all of his people said, amen. Matt Moore is, is our church planner. I invited Matt and Sarah to come forward because all the times that we dive into the text, we don't ever want to be informational. Where we just hear the truth of God. My prayer is that it actually starts to change the way we live our life. That it's transformational. And, and, and for you guys as the Moors, that's what God has done in your life. God did in your life what he did in Adam and Eve's life, what he's done in our life. And I told you guys when we moved here, our vision was not to plant a church in El Dorado Hills, but our vision was to build joy-filled communities of faith. So even before we have our own building, we want to plant other communities of faith because we don't care about a building. We care about JFCFs, joy-filled communities of faith. So thank you for being generous as a church. Thank you for being the living proof of loving God because you're allowing us to invest in these guys corporately, to coach them, to train them. And the EV Free Church came and said, hey, we've got a guy that wants to plant in Sacramento. Will you come and be a part of his assessment? So I was a part of a team, and I left that team, and I called my wife driving back. I said, I want to coach this guy. This guy's the real deal. He's a sinner saved by grace. He, he's an idiot apart from Jesus. That's who he is. Decent guitar player, but he married well so she can sing. But in Christ, in Christ they get that they are broken and that God wants to use them to reflect his glory. So I asked them to come not just to lead worship, but that we might get to know him because we're investing in them financially, but we want to invest in our time, treasure, and talent. We've got our residents here today that just moved up. We've got ministry in India. Be praying for Carl and Kathy Lahr. We're going to look at that next week if you want to join us. In a couple weeks, it's in your worship folder. We want to invest in, in Judea and Samaria, which is sacrament for us. So Matt, thank you for being here. But Thanks how has this text transformed your life to where you are today? Yeah, uh, that line of the song, I didn't understand initially, that bridge where it says, oh, as you run, that thing that hindered love will only become part of the story. Um, I listened to the song over and over again like you did this week, and it brought me to tears, and I don't cry much. I'm not that kind of guy, but like, yes, it, <laughs> but just that God's for me and that he likes me and that all that junk and that mess that God can not only like forgive and forgive fix, but that he redeems and he beautifies. And so that stuff that I was ashamed of, God's going to make it a beautiful part of his story. And uh, for the last few years, the last five years, we've been in different parts of uh, LA in the inner city of South Central. And we've been around a lot of people that are broken. And so I initially went down there and I'm like, you have questions. I have answers. You have problems. I have solutions. I'm going to fix you. And we're going to get this done and it's going to be great. And I didn't realize that God had some undoing to do in my heart. Thing that my wife said is, Matt, the pastor you were in Simi Valley before ain't going to work here, and so you got to be undone. And I thought that was a cute idea and suggestion, but I had no idea that um, God just had a lot of junk to undo in my heart, and a lot of it had to do with my <coughs> self-righteousness. I thought I had something to offer besides Jesus. I knew Jesus, and then me. I was going to offer myself to them. But when I kind of came to the end of myself and looked entirely to God for my strength and my direction— that's what I was offering him. That's what I, I didn't have the answers. I didn't know how to fix the generational sins and the abuse and the pain and the fatherlessness. I didn't have any solutions, but God did. And so when I finally stopped, God started. And so um, a lot about what Drew talked about this morning, that shame, um, only God can rescue. And as I shared the truth of that with people, now here in Oak Park, 
it's like their eyes begin to light up when they have experienced, when people have experienced such despondency and hopelessness and you share in that heart, that dark heart, the light of the gospel, they get it. And they get it even more than I think I do because I still got a cr bunch of cruddy self-righteousness in my heart. They get it because they know they got nothing good to bring to the table. They come out of hiding and they're like, here's my wheelbarrow of sin. God, take it, redeem it, beautify it. And so now we're in Oak Park and we're excited. We're a little overwhelmed, you know. Um, we're meeting. I, I told them, are you sure you want to plant? Because <laughs> it's not easy. No. It's hard. They moved here two months ago. They moved to the community. Yeah. And, and how's that look? It's hard. We're meeting a lot of believers and they hear what we're doing and they're excited, but they're tired. And they're like, if you build it, we'll come. But um, to do the heavy lifting in a community like that means loving people like for a long time, building some relational equity and loyalty, and it takes time. And so um, we're knocking on doors, getting to know people. This next week, we're doing um, a barbecue to get to know our neighbors, and then we're going to do some other stuff. And uh, just being there, I think, is a lot of it. So, And this is why our heart as a church is to be a blessing to others. Our heart as a church is that we would be generous. We do call you guys because God calls you to be generous people so that we as a people of God can be generous because we don't want to just see Eldorado Hills get it. We do. We want to see EDH get it. We want to see the city one for Christ, but we want to see Indy one for Christ. We want to see Oak Park one for Christ. We want to invest in people that get it. And I'll tell you guys, these guys are the real deal. These guys understand that they're broken and apart from Christ they have nothing, but in Christ they have everything to offer. So they've gone. They've taken this call. And we get to spend time together talking about what that's going to look like. And it's going to be hard. And they are literally two years behind us, which is so fun. Because I remember what it was like two years ago and having those launch team meetings and having people flake on you. And being so discouraged and being like, are we sure this is what God wants? Did God really say don't eat the apple? Did God really say Sacramento? Because it's the surface of the sun. Like, it is miserable here sometimes. <laughs> but they've said, yeah, that's what God said. So we go. And our role as a church now is to pray. Our role as a church is to give generously. Our role as a church is to prayerfully support them. To be able, so Matt and I meet regularly for coaching sessions, but you've given some contact info, how we can be a part of what you guys are part of. It's 20 minutes away, guys. As long as once they give us an opportunity, we will hound them with the love of Jesus to be able to support them. We'll wear their Hope Serve shirts. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Yeah, so if you go to the website, we're trying to reach both the privileged and underprivileged where they come together, where it's not the rich serving the poor, but they're in family they're belonging together. And so we're trying to reach Midtown. We have a team up there, and then we're trying to form a team in Oak Park as well. If you want live updates, you can go to the Facebook page. And then if you want to text me, like encouragement, because I love encouragement, there's my cell phone number. And so um, I send out about once a week live prayer requests. And so the one thing I would say that we need prayer for is 1 Thessalonians 1.5, where it says there's this endurance that's produced by hope. Um, I don't want to just keep going, keep going, keep going just because I'm just going to knuckle down. I want to keep going because I see the hope of Jesus, and I know these people do, and so uh, they need to see it. So um, that's the one verse. If you think about it, go there. Just by hope of Jesus, we have this endurance to keep on running. And many of us have our alarms set. We pray for our church at 4 o'clock. Michael said we need to change our alarms, but we, we pray for the yet to believe. I want you to pray for Oak Park. I want you to pray for the Moors. I want you to pray that God would work in their life and that they would use by God. We say we're all broken vessels so that we leak. That's how we're broken. And as God continues to heal and to restore not just their life and their marriage, but he's going to use them to change lives there. And we get to be a part of it. How cool is this? Adam and Eve missed it. They blew it. But God. The Moors missed it. Drew's blowing it. But God. So this week, as you're tempted to be discouraged, do not miss the hope that's in the promise. Do not miss the hope that our God is for you and that life is different because Jesus came. I'd like to invite uh, anybody for Eric, come on forward. Give me any other, uh, do we have any elders here? They were all at first service, I think. Anybody else, come on forward. Mike, come up here. Let's pray for these guys. And if you're here with the church, just raise your hand out as we want to pray for the Moors. Father God, we thank you for the Moors. We pray right now that you would do a work in their life that would be all about your glory that you would use Matt and Sarah to point people towards you as people who are, are sinners saved by grace, that they don't even know they're looking for hope. May they see that in these guys. May they see it in their kids. We pray a covering and a protection that their family unit would be used by you, that their parenting would be used by you, that their meals, this next one on Sunday night, that you would use that, that you invite us into relationship with you. We don't leave broken and sad. We leave leaping, jumping, celebrating the grace that you've given us. So give 
Matt and the Moors grace that is sufficient. Give them grace that raises up things from ashes and makes them beautiful. And may Oak Park be a city that we at Vintage Grace and Elder Hills get a chance to see transformed by the love of the gospel. Use us, we pray, in powerful ways. And all of his people said, amen. You stand for the benediction. We gather every Sunday to be sent. We gather to receive the word, and then we go to be the word. We're sending the Moors back to Oak Park, and we're sending you to your place of work, to your place of, of home, to your little league team, to your soccer team. And I pray that God blesses you and keeps you, and may his face shine upon you, and may he give you hope, and then may you go be the hope for this world that so desperately needs it. Go in peace.